I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to introduce the next session, which I think you'll all be very, uh, find very useful and interesting for the future of spine surgery. We're joined today, this morning, by two of the world's experts in uh, predictive analytics and artificial intelligence, uh, Dr. Chris Ames from UCSF and Dr. Ferran Pelosi from yeah, the Barcelona, 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 Barcelona Spine, Spine Institute. Institute. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it off to our first speaker. Welcome, and, and we look forward to your presentations. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Chris Ames, and um, an honor to be here with you guys today and uh, talk about some of our work in uh, predictive modeling. Uh, all of this work has been done really in conjunction with uh, Farhan and his group as part of a large collaboration between the International Spine Study Group and the European Spine Study Group uh, really over the last uh, probably five years or so. So I'm going to cover kind of part of the topic and then Farhan's going to cover uh, the other half and we're honored to be able to present our work uh, to, uh, uh, to you guys today uh, and thank you Medtronic and thank you uh, Dr. Lenke and um, thank you Dr. Lehman for inviting us. My disclosures, probably the most uh, important part of this disclosure is I do represent the International Spine Study Group in this uh, collaboration with uh, the European group. I I'd like you to think of this, uh, both talks really as, as an incentive and a drive to move from uh, shallow medicine to deeper medicine. And I want to set the stage for that by just comparing, and this is from Eric Topol's book uh, about deep medicine, where we were several, you know, 20, 30 years ago and where we are today. So if you look in 1975, we had 4 million healthcare jobs. Now we have 16 million health in the United States. University of California is the number one employer in California. Uh, these are huge, uh, huge industries. Average spending has, has gone up exponentially. And very importantly, the time allocation we can spend with patients for decision-making and to decrease uh, heterogeneity and outcome and optimize outcome has gone substantially down uh, over, those, uh, over that long uh, period of time. Uh, the amount of money we spend on these patients has dramatically increased up to 18% of GDP. Hospital room charges have dramatically uh, increased as well. And now we have different ways of assessing our treatment of these patients and billing with, with the, the EHRs. It's a mixed bag of collecting more data and spending more money on that whole data collection. Now, how can we improve the care of these patients? Uh, those of us who participated in development meetings with, with industry, Medtronic, and others, uh, it, there's always a drive toward innovating around something you're going to put in the patient. The whole mindset has been around uh, monetizing something that you're going to uh, manufacture and place in a patient. But probably, uh, and I would argue, and probably Ferran as well, over the next uh, decade, we're going to see industry have to monetize more tools that will decrease the heterogeneity and outcome. And that might not be something you put in a patient. It might be something where you plan the case uh, and then maybe you manufacture something that's precise to the patient. If you look at the software development and commercialization with FDA approvals that's gone on over the last decade, uh, it's really been concentrated in histology and pathology as well as radiology. And it's just now making its way to surgery, but it's tremendously increased. And this is up against an aging population, uh, 32 million people in the United States with spinal deformity and a massive healthcare expenditure of 3.7 trillion. So how do we move from shallow medicine to deep medicine? Well, I would argue that the utilization of these collective panels using heuristic human experience uh, in trying to uh, determine what's gonna be the best treatment for patients is still a relatively shallow medicine. We rely on our biases, for these patients, it's better than nothing uh, getting this collective intelligence about what to do, but it's still subject to all the inherent biases that surgeons have, maybe some of the other specialties have about how to treat these patients. Better than nothing, collective intelligence is a bit more accurate uh, than, than not having any sort of secondary input. It's probably very effective at eliminating rogue surgeons, but maybe not very effective at really precisely determining outcome uh, and complication rates prior to surgery. So we need to go deeper. 
what is the evidence for that? You know, a lot of surgeons think uh, I can make the best judgment for my patients. I've never had more hostility to any talks I've given that went around the world. And when I talk about predictive modeling and there's always a surgeon in the audience that says, I know what's best for my patient. You can't replace my surgical judgment. But, but actually when you take a deep dive in the data, like this study from general surgery, it shows that surgeons do a very poor job at actually predicting risk and outcome for their patients. And uh, Farhan may show a couple slides showing that that is also true in the deformity world as well. And why would it, why would it not be? So one way we can use, utilize uh, predictive modeling and, and the leverage the power of machine learning and machines in general is to develop a new way of thinking about patients that's really based uh, in data. Our prior way to determine outcome and optimize outcome on patients has been based on correlation analyses to the sagittal plane that we now know uh, is really an antiquated way to correlate the patient to a certain outcome. And uh, one way that we can start to look at this a bit differently is by starting to group patients by risk and benefit of surgery. And why is this important? Well, let's take, let's take a step back and look at uh, the pharmaceutical industry. This is from Eric Topol's book as well, but if you look at responders versus non-responders to expensive commonly employed drugs, you see that actually most of the patients are non-responders to these very common, very expensive agents. The same is probably true in surgery. Uh, many patients don't get better with operations, as you can see from a, a general graphical representation of our entire database of outcomes. And what if we could direct uh, our resources and our treatments to those subsets of patients that share certain qualities and where they're more likely to have a benefit from our expensive operative interventions? And this is really about moving, again, from shallow uh, ideas around correlating the sagittal plane to deeper approaches, looking at phenotyping, deep learning, and all this, all this is really designed to improve outcomes and give us more time to spend empathic time with the patients and not to replace, uh, not to replace um, our uh, human interaction with other humans. And so uh, the sagittal plane, as I mentioned, is, uh, has relatively poor correlation uh, to uh, outcomes, especially at two-year follow-up. So we need a different way of doing this. So one way, is the approach on the left. And this is kind of a modern surgeon's approach to looking at these patients. The surgeon's good and is up to date on the recent literature. He's giving them a frailty score, which is again, kind of a bigger data approach to the patients, which we published a few years ago. He's giving them a comorbidity index. He's giving them a, a, a bone mineral density. And he's also radiographically measuring uh, the sagittal plane um, as well. But on the right, is, is something unparalleled in the way that humans can look at patients. Essentially, this is the way the computer would see the same patient based upon a hundred variables immediately in real time. And this is a representation of our whole database. The computer can say, this is you, surrounded by your nearest neighbors, similar patients, similar ages, similar comorbidities, similar deformities. And in real time can pull up those patients and we can say, this is how your, these patients did. These are the mistakes that we made. These were the outcomes of these patients. Not only what we did, but what like Ferran did in Barcelona or Ibrahim Obi did in, in Bordeaux. We can look immediately around the world. Uh, and this is something that's not possible you know, for humans to do. So moving from a shallow classification based on weak correlations to the coronal plane, AI has allowed us to build a new adult deformity classification based upon unsupervised learning and clustering pattern recognition, essentially, that immediately in real time gives us a risk versus benefit of surgery. And that is what I think patients and physicians really want at the point of care. They wanna take a, a 30,000 foot view initially, pull up similar patients, look at how they did, and then place a patient on this type of graph and say, if you have this type of surgery, patients like yourself, did this well. This is what they experienced, how they recovered across all these different domains of outcome assessment. So I think this is a better way, a deeper way to look at uh, deformity classification. Now, what else does this give us? And I just have one slide on this, but as was pointed out to us by our chief AI scientist, Mikel Serra, 
This allows you to cluster patients by effect size. And what that does is rather than, rather than doing a 700 patient clinical trial on patients that are very different with lower effect sizes, you can have just as much statistical power by concentrating a randomized trial within a cluster. And this is gonna be the future, I think, of clinical trials benefiting from AI to cluster patients. Now, what is kind of the, the future area for this? Well, one of the things we realize is we don't have enough information. There's some things that we know we don't know, like genetics and, and muscular assessments uh, about patients, but there are probably going to be things in the future, such as SNP analysis and other aspects of serological and genetic analysis that may be impacting patients uh, that we need to include in our databases, and this is subject of current work. One of the things we're doing at UCSF is looking specifically at aging. We're looking at telomere length uh, and correlating that to risk of complication. This is a collaboration that we have with Elizabeth Blackburn, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for telomere identification. And we saw that telomere length correlates more to risk of uh, major complication than chronological age. And this is something we're submitting uh, this year to the SRS. We need to also datify the bone Think of all the fusion operations that we're doing, but we're not tailoring a fusion cocktail with osteoinductive agents, osteoconductive agents, mineralization agents, densification agents. We're not tailoring this specifically to the patient. We're just giving everyone the same cocktail. And as I'll show you in the end of the talk, when we talk about custom realignment planning with custom rods, it's very similar to where this is gonna go in the future, where we're gonna have customized uh, bone cocktails for patients that can optimize their fusion. So we prevent what we're showing you here, which is a pseudoarthrosis. This is very common complication of this type of surgery. So what we're trying to do here is a, at UCSF is a big serological and bone biopsy study of fusion rates utilizing big data. One of the other ways that our work has really impacted, uh, I think uh, in real time, the way we think about treating these patients is that as Ferran's gonna show you, a lot of the variability in complication rates, especially, is due to variability in the patient. And about a third of that variability is potentially optimizable. So just like social media companies wanna better predict what you're gonna click on by polarizing you, and we're going through this right, right now in the country, right? We can better predict how someone's gonna do with surgery by polarizing them, essentially making them a more homogeneous population that is better optimized for surgery through physical therapy, pain management optimization, bone mineral density optimization, smoking cessation, et cetera. And this is a study that we just started at UCSF a few weeks ago, looking at trying to make everyone more homogeneous and more optimized for surgery through extensive prehabilitation. And this is something that came directly out of our AI work. Finally, some other implications of this work has to do with resource utilization. I don't care what you say about the United States, we're gonna enter healthcare rationing. It's already come to the European countries. We have limited budgets. And uh, this is a study that was on the podium at NAS and at SRS this year, uh, headed up by uh, Rushi Joshi and Mikhail Serra, showing that if you use uh, the power of predictive modeling prior to spending money on interventions, you can essentially set filters of what you wanna say is your complication tolerance, what you wanna say is your outcome expectation within a, a first world or second world economy and spend your money on those patients that are most likely to have a significant benefit. So you set a MCID filter, you set a complication filter, and then that's gonna show you how much money you can save in your economy by directing those ASD resources to the patients that are most likely to have that sort of pattern of risk and improvement. In the United States, this, this approach would be estimated based on our simulation to save about $500 million in ineffective uh, surgery that doesn't boost uh, the improvement of patients uh, over time. And this can also have an impact on benchmarking. It's another way to think about uh, utilizing predictive modeling rather than taking a very shallow medicine approach and trying to equilibrate large academic centers who treat very complicated patients to centers that treat uh, private patients and do potentially simpler surgery. Look at PJF as a model for that. Uh, if you look at the variability in the International Spine Study Group and our PJF rates, it looks like you're like, geez, wow, some of these sites are really underperformers. Some are significant overperformers doing a great job. Some sites are way out. 
in their PJF rates. So if you draw just an average across there, you think, well, that's how we did it in the past. That's how they do it on these websites. Um, but really, some of these sites are treating probably patients that are more deformed, that are more frail, and doing bigger operations. A better way to do that is to generate a model that would actually predict what their rate of PJF should be based upon their patient population and their operations. And you can see, interestingly, some sites that seem like they were doing a great job based on average were actually underperformers based on predictive modeling. And some of the sites that had high rates actually were not, were actually doing a pretty good job given their patient population. In the next couple minutes to finish up, I wanna talk about how you take all this predictive modeling information and you make sure you execute because the best laid plan doesn't matter unless you make sure that at surgery, you're gonna accomplish the goal that your predictive modeling said that you should accomplish. Probably the best way to do that is through the use uh, for alignment anyway, if you look specifically at alignment, is through the use of customized realignment plans then executed in the patient using utilizing custom rods. So for the past probably three years now, we've been using the Medicrea product, designing a custom realignment plan for the patient. After we run all the predictive models about risk and outcome, we then utilize the uh, Medicrea plans based on AI around re reciprocal changes to make sure we execute that plan at the time of surgery. Here's a patient we wanted to leave about five to 10 degrees head down so he could walk downstairs. And essentially we drop our rod in at the end of our uh, correction and we know this patient's gonna have the perfect chin brow vertical angle that we want for his realignment. Why do we need this? You know, surgeons say, oh, um, uh, it used to be that your prowess as a deformity surgeon was really uh, how good a rod bender you were. I mean, I, I remember hearing some very prominent surgeons brag about their rod bending capability. But if you look at it, this is a very serious aspect of the surgery. The best laid plan doesn't work unless you realign the patient adequately. So if you just do a 16 degree variation in your bend, you can place the patient at uh, nine degrees positive, which is probably gonna be unacceptable. And, uh, and a 16 degree variance can make the patient properly corrected. So I don't know about you, I don't feel like I can properly bend 16 degrees uh, at 5.1. Also, if you overbend the rod by 10 degrees, you can make that patient negative by 2.3 centimeters, which potentially is something even worse I've found in my, in my population. These age adjustment alignment goals, especially around overcorrection, like I just showed you, can have significant impacts on failure rates in PJK. Again, trying to make sure we have a, a best laid plan that we execute at surgery. And if you actually look at the data about how surgeons bend rods, this was a great study Justin Smith presented at Eurospine this year, where we asked surgeons to bend rods to a specific angle, and then we measured how they did. Well, despite what they would tell you about their rod bending prowess, turned out that they did a terrible job. <laughs> they average, average over bent the rod by 19 degrees without a template. And as I showed you in the prior examples, that 19 degree over or under bend can substantially malalign the patient. So if you have AI on the front end, you have to make sure you have execution at the time of surgery to make sure that your plan uh, reaches your goal. And this just shows you how people were all over the place. The whole idea of AI is trying to make the outcomes and execution more homogeneous and less variable in these operations that cost over $100,000. With a template though, very similar to a custom rod, surgeons did a good job. So without the rod, they had a variance of about 18 degrees. If you look at historical data on realignment, again, Overall, not just rods, but surgeons did a bad job. 55% SVA corrected, only 25% pelvic tilt correction. Um, and when, when this technology is adopted around the world, look at the power uh, of AI as manifested through now the new technology of precision rods. Within five years, developing software around reciprocal change prediction has really populated itself around the world. And I think the same is gonna happen with calculators um, and with potentially other augmenting technologies like virtual reality, robotics, uh, and precision medicine around risk and outcome calculation. The hub contains now about si a data set of 6,000 patients that they use to generate and improve these machine learning algorithms for realignment. 
we look briefly at the UCSF data, 372 deformity cases. Here's a typical example of that, utilizing the template to determine when we realigned our patient uh, appropriately. And you can see the template drawn on the x-ray looks exactly like the rod put in the patient, even with a PSO and a four rod construct. The average error in these patients is six degrees uh, PILL, eight degrees thoracic kyphosis, three degrees of pelvic tilt and SVA of three centimeters. It's not perfect, but it will undergo multiple, uh, multiple iterations of improvement. And if you compare the SVA correction that we achieved to historical data, as well as PILL and pelvic tilt correction to historical data, you can see substantial improvement, especially around something that's variable like the pelvic tilt, but also in the PILL correction. And again, the huge power of this is in moving forward. It's in making surgeons commit to a realignment plan, do more cases, build more data, learn how that individual surgeon varies as well as how the overall database varies, add in new technology, and then re-machine learn the reciprocal change prediction, retrain the models and improve accuracy over time. So the huge power of this whole new strategy in deep medicine, precision outcome prediction, AI prediction, and realignment planning is really the power of making it all a closed loop. And that is going to be taking us to the, the realm of, of deep medicine where errors in realignment should be errors in planning, not in execution. Because errors in planning can be, re, uh, be corrected through iterations of this machine learning loop can be optimized, data feedback can be incorporated, and the plans can be optimized over time. Um, some things that are still not uh, totally optimized is there is some rod deformation that goes on during cantilever correction, and there's some flexibility data that was not included in the original data set of unfused segments, but again, this will all be corrected over time over the next several years as a database is built out. So I, I thank you guys very much uh, for your attention. And uh, I'll turn it over to Farhan, who will uh, continue us on our journey from a 30,000 foot view to a, to a, a 1,000 foot view in uh, deeper medicine for these ASD patients. Good day, everyone. And thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I'll try to put some more arguments uh, justifying uh, the great benefits of artificial intelligence, specifically in adult spinal deformity. Well, you know, uh, there are some pathologies and one of them is AAS that generally speaking, they are quite homogeneous and where you have normally a great consensus among specialists regarding treatment and you can have very predictable results. But other pathologies as adult spinal deformity where um, the patients are much more heterogeneous and there's a huge variability and heterogeneity in the way of treating and addressing these patients. There's another uh, input, another important thing related to the patients with adult spinal deformity, which is the uh, great impact of the deformity in their quality of life. So you have uh, heterogeneity of patients, different ways to treat it, and a huge impact in quality of life in patients who do not improve generally speaking, with non-operative treatment. Well, this is what I did in this case, but we had a huge discussion, and this is a very common and typical uh, regular case of adult spinal deformity that I solved personally with an anterior approach at L5-S1, a PSO at L2, and I did it in two days. So I split it, I stayed surgery. But obviously, this patient could have plenty of other options of treatment, giving or ending up with the same, exactly the same surgical result, but maybe with a different outcome. So if you compare complications, for instance, and you go into uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and you have the, most of the published data you see from the harm study group, anterior posterior surgery, the SRS and the combined, and you see that the rate of complications first is extremely low, so results are quite predictable. And at the same time, variability in terms of the rate of complications is very narrow. On the contrary, if you go to adult spinal deformity, you see that 
the risk of uh, complications is extremely high having patients above 65 years of age, which have a chance of running into a complication of 71% being a major complications in almost one third of the patients. So why, uh, how, how can we um, see or assess if the patient has more or less risk of complications? Well, complications are due and this is, I think, extremely important. And one of the reasons why we should use artificial intelligence is due to the interaction of multiple factors. Factors coming from patients are mentioned by Chris before. You have frailty, you have age, you have comorbidities. Factors related to the disease itself, the severity of the deformity, the rigidity of the deformity, and factors related to the treatment you want to used to solve the situation of the patient. So we have plenty of individual papers showing which are the risk factors related to complications. And at the end of the day, if you look into the paper, the results section or the summary or abstract, you get an odds ratio. Normally it's a mean odds ratio. But if you go for instance to pelvic, uh, pedicle subtraction or steotomy, this is increasing as you can see uh, the risk of complication by 2.8, but the range of this odds ratio is from 1.25 to 6.65. So which is the odds ratio you have to apply to your own specific patient? What happens is this patient is diabetic or this patient is obese. How do you make these interactions individually in between the different risk factors? Well, if you use mean values, as has been mentioned by uh, Chris Ames, we know from our uh, combined database that exclusively 5% of the patients included in the combined ISSG ESG database can be represented by averages and mean values. So in other words, in 95 applying published mean values or mean odd ratio would not be relevant to, for this patient. So we need something more individualized. The other point I mentioned is that you cannot apply exclusively one risk factor. You have to combine them. And you see in different papers that by combining at least two uh, risk factors that we've shown in these two papers, you increase very much your predictability. Well, the point is that in our patients, you don't have to add only two risk factors, you have to add and to combine multiple risk factors. So we have different options. We can go for, let's say, the uh, shallow medicine, as was mentioned by Chris, and use averages. You can go to clusters, then you go really to a more homogeneous group of patients, but the ideal obviously is going right to the point and to the individual. And how can you do that? So uh, surgeons can say, okay, I, I am experienced. I have a lot of intuition and I can do that by myself. So we could uh, see, and I'll show you that by distributing nine um, adult spinal deformity cases to 39 surgeons, 75 of them with more than 10 years of experience. And we ask them to provide us their risk perception in terms of which was the risk of running into a major complications and expert opinion based on intuition, experience, and obviously published data, as you can see, is extremely heterogeneous. And you have for some cases that the risk was uh, uh, ranged from 5% of running into a major complications to 70% based on the different surgeons for the same case. And even you have cases where the range of uh, risk range from 1% uh, to 100%. In general, surgeons tended to overestimate the risk of major complications and reinterventions early in the, seven, in the first 72 hours and tended to underestimate the risk at uh, 90 days and at two years of post-op. Well, uh, this has also been mentioned before, we can use collective. Um, collective intelligence. So we put together a committee with different people trying to cover different disciplines. And uh, there's something here that 
obviously there's going to be a bias and the most common bias is confirmation bias so uh, we have a tendency to see exclusively what confirms our beliefs and this is one of the problems and probably artificial intelligence is going to provide more objective data but there's even more i think that it's difficult to create a committee combining all the needed disciplines and combining all the risk factors that can um, uh, influence and predict the risk of complications and outcomes. In fact, what we get with artificial intelligence is that we get a prediction which is not based on assumption, assumptions. It detects automatically which is the variable interactions and it jeracizes the variables so it can tell you which one is the, the one having most weight, which one is potentially uh, modifiable, and therefore you can adjust the time and the type of treatment you can do. This is what you get when you use mean values. You have a mean curve or risk of major complication and a mean curve telling you which is the mean risk of reintervention and reoperation. But reality is much more complex. And this is on the left, you have what happened, the mean values for our patients in the combined database. And on the right, you have reality. So the risk of major complications, for instance, is in our database range from 4% to 74%. So what artificial intelligence is going to allow you is to provide the individual risk curve for each patient, combining all the risk parameters that have been captured by the database. This is an important issue, and I'll go back to that later. But this is an example, and based on the calculators for risk uh, of major complications that were published last year, and on outcome prediction also published last year. So we put all the data we have. So for that, you need an extensive uh, database, and you have patient data, disease data, and treatment data the engine works and provides you individual curves for risk and health-related quality of life gain. And these curves can be used to provide the risk at 72 hours or 48 hours. This is allowing you to select which are the patients going or needed in an ICU, which is the risk of 90 days complication, one year or two years, and even reintervention. So this is providing you the full uh, risk prediction and at the same time it provides you the other dimension so it's extremely difficult for a committee to provide these two dimensions complications and health related quality of life gain and we've seen I've shown by the clusters and Greece that some patients have huge chances of improving quality of life even if they have high risk of complications but maybe these are scenarios that we should go for because the advantage or the gain in quality of life justifies complications. It's difficult to get that information from a committee. Regarding the reliability of the data and the calculators, we've done two phases. Now we're going to stay the phase three, but in phase one that was based in 16, uh, 12, uh, 1612 patients, and then we did the second phase with 2300 patients. Uh, we have two models. We have the model that can predict what's going to happen before surgery. And then you have the model, which is uh, in red, that predicts you what's going to happen once you close the skin. So you know what happened in surgery. And you have on the horizontal axis, the prediction that is provided by the calculators, uh, by, by, the, by, the real re the, by the calculators, and on the vertical axis, y-axis you have what really happened. So you see that it's quite predictable, quite reliable, and reliability measured with the C-index is approximately between 70 and 75 percent. The calculators, because we have more data, are almost 80 percent accurate when you go early. So early predictions, the calculators are much better, and they are less accurate for two years and three years follow-up prediction, probably because of loss of follow-up. Importantly, you can add another variable. You can add the cost. So you can add different values and different variables of prediction, which is even more difficult 
for a committee to give provide these answers. So these uh, calculators are now, I would say, uh, being spreadly used in all specialties, and they are already uh, uh, active in spine. Adult spinal deformity, as we've shown for ISSG and ESSG, but you have here the spine lumbar fusion outcomes calculator, which has been uh, recently published, or you have the one which uh, is uh, coming out from the SPORT trial, which was published two years ago. And more recently, a few weeks or days ago, you had another calculator and see here the predict the C value, which is a little bit lower than ours, but it's they are all more, more, most of them, they are around 75 or just below 75% prediction for cervical myelopathy. Other specialties, general surgery has been mentioned and cardiovascular surgery has also been um, shown to be extremely uh, uh, useful to use predictive analytics to decide which is the best strategy for each patient having cardiovascular diseases. One point which I think is extremely important and is solving one of the most relevant misunderstandings in artificial intelligence. And this slide here is showing that what is really relevant is not the number of patients included in the database to get a good prediction. Here you have a database with almost 30, 35,000 patients. And you see that the predictions are really low with an R square below 20%. So it's not the amount or the number of patients uh, in the database which is nourishing the uh, calculators, what is important. The important thing is the quality of the data. So what's coming and what's already there? So we know that tissue is absolutely important. Biomarkers, sarcopenia biomarkers are relevant to predict complication. We know that uh, real-time health measures can be extremely important, sleeping hours, activity, behavior. All this data is already being collected and all this data has shown to have an impact in complications. It's difficult to see that all this data can be combined by human minds, a committee or by single expert. And for that, it's clear that what's coming is gonna be artificial intelligence. I'd like to conclude that Clearly, information generation nowadays in healthcare is growing extremely quickly and outstripping the capacity of human cognition to adequately manage. Computer technologies can assimilate big data sets and make sense of the complex relationship between variables in a flexible, trainable manner. And while it's not a substitute for clinical experience, computerized technologies clearly provide objective data about individual risk and avoid common biases, which are normally observed in clinical decision-making. I think that the key premise of developing this C technology is clearly to augment what we are doing now based on human performance. I would like to thank all my co-authors and uh, contributors, uh, especially uh, members of the ISSG and ESSG and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.